I have never made pasta in my life other than boiling the water and shoving it right in. Rose? Actually, Lorenzo, you're on your own this time. What the fudge? Today, guys, we're gonna be seeing two of my favorite people on Epicurious. We're gonna be seeing how Frank and Lorenzo make their carbonara. So this should be interesting. If you are new to the channel, my name is James Mankinson. I've been cooking for many, many years in the United States and over here in Europe, and I have plenty of other videos and recipe videos. I also have remade Jamie Oliver's Carbonara, and that was a surprising result as well. So if you haven't seen that video, you should definitely check that out after seeing this one. So before we get going, be sure to give this a like, a share, and a subscribe, and let's get started. Okie dokie, okie dokie. Thank goodness I'm ambidextrous. Lorenz is going to be making carbonara today. I'm curious to see how he's going to make this. This will be interesting. Lorenzo's funny. Hi, I'm Frank. I'm a professional chef, and these are my $174 pasta carbonara ingredients. 174 bucks for carbonara. My goodness. You don't even spend that much going to a, like a Michelin star restaurant to have carbonara. Well, then again, it's a point to make these videos, isn't it? And I bet that the most expensive ingredient, if you look at the list here, or you look at the ingredients, is actually going to be the olive oil. I bet it is. It's either that, or maybe the cheese. Depends. I think it's the olive oil. Hi, I'm Lorenzo, and I'm a home cook. And these are my $10 pasta carbonara ingredients. Peas? Peas? Oh, it's always with peas, isn't it? We even saw Gordon Ramsay making his carbonara at home with peas. Come on. This is England. Some fresh peas. 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 And he still called this carbonara. This guy. Like I didn't know that was going to happen. Peas and cream? That is some cheese. <laughs> I was planning on making a homemade Kitara pasta carbonara with a 24 month aged Parmesan cheese. I had some double O flour and some farm fresh eggs to make my own pasta by hand. I have never made pasta in my life other than boiling the water and shoving it right in. If none of you have ever made homemade pasta, it can seem like it may be a little challenging in the beginning, but to be honest, it's actually easier than making bread. I mean, making homemade pasta can be very easy, unless of course you're gonna be making a lot, but it's easy and you will notice a big difference between the quality between dried and fresh. I had some guanciale, which is super fancy bacon, and some premium parmesan and pecorino cheese. Wow, that is, you stinky. Along with a lovely olive oil and an even lovelier bottle of red wine. Am I putting wine in this? It was gonna be rich, creamy, and absolutely spectacular. With Lorenzo's recipe, I have some ingredients you might find in your pantry or your local grocery store. These may be simple ingredients, but with a little technique and a little chef magic, I can make it beautiful. Huh? What do you know? It's Jamie's favorite type of pasta. Pasta. Grab the pasta by two hands, twist it into the water. By twisting it, it won't stick together. If I had a guess, this would probably cost around 10 bucks. I'm the one that does the grocery shopping. I know the groceries. If I had to guess, this would cost about $222. Well, that's a very expensive plate of pasta. This is Frank's recipe book. No GPS whatsoever, no connect the dots, no ABCs. It may help though next time to add the instructions for Lorenzo or for somebody else though. This, yes. Lorenzo, remember, this pasta is not all that hard. Pasta carbonara is a pretty simple dish, but I don't know about this situation. Worry about your technique. Don't worry about so much the ingredients. This is the part where I call Rose. <laughs> Rose? Rose? Actually, Lorenzo, you're on your own this time. You're joking. Rose couldn't make it today, so time to leave the nest, little chickadee. What the fudge? Yes, let's do it. Yes, let's do it. Okay. I hate you all. Lorenzo, you can do this. Come on. You've been doing some amazing things on Epicurious, and I think you have this. The biggest challenge right off the bat is homemade spaghetti. I usually just scan it in the grocery. Boop! I'm going to have Lorenzo do this granny style. And by granny style, I mean he's going to make a pile of his flour. Now we've got Montezuma. Montezuma? More like Mount Etna or Vesuvius. Both of those are still alive and active. Last year I went to Napoli 
And I have to tell you that when you think of Mount Vesuvius, you'd think, okay, it's another volcano. But when you're actually there in Napoli, that's all you see. I mean, it is enormous and you clearly see Vesuvius. And if that thing were to go today, it's one of the most dangerous volcanoes, I believe, in the world because of the amount of people living so close to it. He's going to make a volcano. We're going to crack our eggs in there, a little bit of salt, and then we're going to whisk our eggs with a fork. We don't want our volcano erupting. Volcano save. Once we get to a point where the eggs aren't going to run out anymore, we start to bring our flour in, and then we start to knead. Never done this before, and I, I, fairly simple so far. And we're going to knead our dough until it's nice and smooth, like my bald head. <laughs> that's cute as heck. Oh, that's funny. It might be as smooth as his head, but it's not going to be as shiny. Sorry, Frank. <laughs> When we knead the flour, we're really working the gluten, and the gluten is really tough. And this is why we let the pasta rest for about 20 minutes, so that it's easier to roll out, and we get nice, kind of long strands of spaghetti. Lorenzo did a good job making this pasta. He didn't have much flour left over, and I mentioned this because in the previous video with Joshua and the lasagna, uh, well, Vincenzo was critiquing Joshua on his lasagna skills, on the pasta skills, I should say, specifically. He did good with the lasagna, but the pasta, you know, the recipe it was a little off. But next time, come to Vincenzo's plate if you want to learn how to make pasta, like my nonna. From Lorenzo, I have some peas and Parmesan. When carbonara came across the big ocean, people decided they want to put peas in it. And I'm going to have a little fun with it. I'm going to dehydrate them both. This is going to be the topping for my finished dish. Like a little bit of a garnish, a little bit of sprinkle, a little bit of flair. If there are any Italians watching, just take into consideration that this is not supposed to be an authentic carbonara. Just keep this in mind. It's for entertainment only. Basically what a dehydrator does is it takes the moisture out of things with a small amount of heat and some fan. And then these puppies are gonna go into my dehydrator. Dehydration takes a while, so that's why we're doing it first. This is gonna be in there about six hours. Six hours. Having a dehydrator at home is a great way on making your own dehydrated products. You can make chips out of it, you can make jerky, you can dehydrate almost anything and everything. Then again, it may be a little expensive unless you're making like a lot of, uh, well, say beef jerky or anything. I need to roll it out. First off, let me flour my table here. Okay. Oh, ooh, that's a nice little bite it took out of that. Okay. Let's see what to do, what to do, what to do. Uh, trying to work this. It's a workout. I think this is good. I mean, it is a very thin sheet. Lorenz is doing this the old way, by hand. And yeah, you can do it by hand. It's not impossible, but it's going to take a lot of elbow grease to do it. And you will not have as consistent, say, as a consistent thickness with the pasta. But it's still doable, still functional. If you make the pasta at home and you like making fresh pasta, then you may want to invest in a pasta making machine because then it will make your life easier. Pasta. Let's cut these out. <laughs> so I'm gonna have a little fun today and play with the whole idea of carbonara. I'm gonna make a carbonara frittata. A carbonara frittata? Oh, bloody hell no. Just the idea of putting pasta into basically a tortilla. Um, I mean, I have Italian friends and I have heard of this is maybe not the most common thing, but I have heard that some people do do it. Uh, well, well, we'll find out, won't we? Classically, a frittata is a baked omelet. It's going to be like carbonara, but in a pie cut slice. Makes sense, right? Now, guys, if this was Spain, we'd be making a tortilla instead of a frittata. And the difference between the two, there is a bit of a difference. The frittata you put in the oven and you bake it basically. I mean, you can still cook it on the stovetop, but it goes in the oven. The tortilla on the other hand, the Spanish tortilla, you don't put it in the oven. You can, you can cheat if you want, but you don't. You cook it in the pan. And the big thing with the Spanish tortilla is flipping it too. So you have to get the flipping part down because as we've seen with some people like Adam Ragusea, if you're not very skilled in it, uh, you can make a big mess. One thing you want to make sure when you cook dry pasta, you want the water to be salty, not so salty that it's not edible, but you want it to be sea salty. And I want it to be at a full rolling boil. If it's not boiling, it's going to clump together and stick together. Everybody into the pool. 
here we go. We're using Jamie's favorite type of pasta. Also, guys, let me know down below what your favorite type of pasta is, or the specific shape, I should say. Let me know down below or what type of pasta you like the best. Until it comes back to a boil, you gotta keep it stirring to keep it separate, and so it doesn't stick to the bottom. This is gonna take approximately 10 to 12 minutes. Okay, may I look? On top of smoke. What the? What? I thought I was gonna have a cranker. Oh, I just press it down. See, this is the old way of making spaghetti. And uh, well, it's more of the rustic way. It's pretty cool using this. I haven't used this actually. And I've never used this. I've used the pasta machines, but doing it this way, it looks pretty cool. A la Katara. Okay, I see. I'm just gonna get started. The Katara is a contraption that has guitar strings. That's where it gets the idea. Flower liberally, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your flat pasta sheet, put it on top, and you get something that looks like a rolling pin, and you push it through. Cool. 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 Wow! Homemade. Spaghetti a la Katara. Get out of town. That's awesome. Kadoosh, people. Thank you, Katara. <laughs> How do you test pasta? You take a piece of pasta and you test it, right? This still has a little bit of a white ring in it. It's a little before al dente, but I'm okay with that because the pasta is gonna sit for a minute and it's gonna continue to cook. For me personally, I like my pasta al dente. It depends on everyone. Not everybody likes their pasta al dente. Some people like it even a little less done and others like it done, like overcooked. But if you're gonna be making like a pasta salad, it needs to be overcooked. Otherwise, you're gonna have like little nuggets. So when you bite into the pasta, it's gonna be, you know, a little crunchy and you don't want that. All the Italians out there, don't get upset with me. Normally you don't wanna put oil on pasta because the sauce won't stick. But I'm not saucing this pasta. I'm making it into a frittata, so I'm not worried about the oil. Pasta in a frittata. If there are any Italians watching, please, is it really common? I don't know. I mean, I can see the reason behind like leftovers. This, yes. I don't know. It's just, to me, it's a little bizarre. <laughs> this is Frank going off on a tangent. It's gonna be okay. It looks like Got some pork jowl. Guanciale is actually the jowls of the pig that are cured. Guanciale is salty, fatty, and it's traditionally what we use in carbonara. Guanciale is one of those ingredients that it makes a big difference if you can get it. If you can't, you can substitute, you can get uh, pancetta, you can also use bacon if you have to use it. But getting the uh, pig cheeks or the actual guanciale and it cured, it makes a big difference. I like to cut my guanciale into lardon, which is a French term for kind of thick matchsticks. I don't want it just to be a flavoring, I want it to be a nice component of the dish that gives you some like nice heartiness. I like to start with just a little bit of olive oil in my pan. I'm gonna throw those pieces of guanciale in there. Wow, it smells so good already. Render them out until they're just slightly brown on the outside and we've got a lot of fat in the pan. Now me personally, when I use say the guanciale for carbonara, or even if I have to use lardons for anything else, I like to cook them to where they have still a bit of a soft center. So they're crispy on the outside, but you still have that soft center because if you overcook them, you will have little pebbles and it's fine. Some people like them like this, where the guanciale is actually harder. Uh, me, no, because I like my teeth and I don't want to chip my teeth. He's gonna save the guanciale that's cooked and he's saving the fat because the fat's going in there too. Fat equals flavor. I'm gonna turn the heat off and move on to the next step. Lorenzo gave me bacon. Carbonara needs to have some sort of pig product. Bacon works for me. I'm gonna use a little olive oil just to start my bacon out. This is just a personal preference of mine. I'm just gonna cut my bacon into nice strips. A little thicker because I want to see the bacon in my dish. Right into my pan. I'm gonna use everything. I'm using the bacon, I'm gonna use the fat, I'm also going to use the pan. Now my only thing with using bacon for carbonara is that with the bacon, typically it's smoked. You can get unsmoked bacon, you can, but typically it is smoked. So this is going to add another flavor to the carbonara. If it matters a lot to you that it needs to be perfect, then you may want to be trying to get some guanciale if you can find it. Move it to a cooler spot on my stove and just let it sit in the pan until we're ready to make this frittata. 
<laughs> okay, so I'm gonna start prepping my sauce and I have these lovely chunks of cheese, Parmesan Reggiano, and this is the Pecorino. I'm just gonna take a chunk off here. I'll probably need more, but for now, let's uh, do that. Wow. Oh, that smelled. <laughs> I'll get more in a second. Okay, this is the 24 month aged Parmesan. That is delicious. Mmm. A 24 month Parmigiano Reggiano. This is a nice cheese. Or even the Pecorino. I mean, they're stinky cheeses. They're good. But that smell I like because it means that the cheese has a lot of flavor. Lorenzo sent me cream for this. Cream is not something that normally goes into carbonara. That creaminess comes from the technique, not from actually using milk product or cream in your dish. Yeah, cream for a carbonara. Cream is cheating to make a carbonara. I mean, you can do it. However, there are many different types of pasta dishes and one French pasta dish does involve creme fraiche, which I have made on my channel before and I make at home, but it's not, at least to me, it's not carbonara. It's another dish separate. So if there are any Italians watching, I clearly differentiate between the two. This, yes. So what I decided to do is make a custard. That'll be the base of our frittata. I'm probably not gonna use all this cream. I don't want it to stop my custard from setting. So I'm gonna add about half right now. Nice couple of big pinches of salt. Uh, Lorenzo sent me pre-ground black pepper. I tend not to use this in my house. I find when you grind your own pepper, you get more fragrance, you get a little more heat. So I'm gonna add a little extra black pepper just to give it a little like oomph, right? That's a lot of black pepper, Frank. Even if it's pre-crushed, that's a lot. But this is true, and Frank is right about this, is that fresh, especially freshly cracked black pepper is best. You get more flavor, more heat, and you don't lose that intensity that you do or you can lose with pre-cracked black pepper. Because Lorenzo was so generous with the cream, I'm gonna make a garnish with it. This is going to be a savory black pepper whipped cream. You gotta try it, right? We gotta throw it out there. I'm going to season it up lightly. I want the sweet cream to kind of come through. All right, you can see my cream is starting to bubble away. I'm gonna shut it off and I'm gonna add a nice, generous helping of my black pepper. And I'm just gonna let this steep for about five minutes. Even more black pepper. Frank, take it easy on the black pepper, even though it's pre-grounded. Um, wow, that is a lot of black pepper. We'll extract some of those black pepper flavors and some of the floral notes of the black pepper, as well as a little bit of heat. Uh, let's get this strained out. If there's a few black pepper flecks in there or if it has a little color in it, it's fine. It's not a big deal. Let's get this in the fridge and chill it completely. Now, if you're gonna be using a sieve to pass any sauce or any liquid, it is a better idea if you wanna take out, say, like little black pepper particles to use a fine mesh sieve or chinois, something that's super, super, super fine mesh. That way you can take out more than what this is. You can still take some stuff out, but you know, it depends on the size. I guess I'm supposed to toast some peppercorns. About, let's do about like a tablespoon or so, let's see. You're gonna toast your peppercorns because when you toast them, it brings out some of those nice essential oils and makes them a little more fragrant and toasty. Toasting black peppercorns can help bring out that flavor and you can either use a pestle and mortar if you want to crush them or if you buy a pepper mill, it's easier. You just put the peppercorns in the pepper mill and then crush it, you know, however you want it and use it when you want. That is a much easier method. It's a really quick toast. We are gonna put this in. It smells fantastic, you guys. My pepper infused cream is completely chilled. I got myself a cold bowl. Let's whip it up. Uh, just throw it in there. Make sure like if there's any sort of flecks in the bottom, if there's too many flecks, you can just leave them there. A whisk is meant to produce bubbles. So if I tilt my bowl like this, what do you see? Lots of bubbles, right? The whole idea with a whisk, especially a fine wired whisk, is to incorporate air as quickly as possible. So you can do this by hand. It's gonna take a little bit of elbow grease, or if you have an actual stand mixer, uh, an actual mixer, then it'd be a lot faster. It's almost like an up and over where you're seeing lots of air bubbles. We're getting nice and fluffy. All right, I think we're there. Put my whisk in, form a peak. See how the peak points up? Firm peaks or stiff peaks. So our black pepper whipped cream is done. Let's put it in the fridge until we're ready to plate. 
hmm, I'm curious to see how this is going to turn out. I'm very, very curious to see. I'm just gonna add half of this. I'll save a little bit later. I love adding more pepper to my carbonara, but let's go half for now. It's not even cooked yet, you guys, and it looks fantastic. Okay, really the next step is me getting the pasta cooking and putting the stuff together. You know, I have to admit that I do like carbonara, but it's not my favorite dish. And it's a very popular dish, but like super popular. But for me personally, it's not my favorite. I have other dishes that I would say are my favorite, while well, pizza for one, I like a lot more. But I am surprised at how popular carbonara is. Our peas and cheese are done. They've been in here for about six hours. Look at them. Look at those little nuggets of happiness. And let's check out the cheese. The cheese is a little drier. It still has a little bit of that the fat to it. Now I have my peas. I really just want to kind of beat them up a little and so they're not gonna break anyone's teeth. I just want it to be a nice crunchy kind of bite at the end. Let's go right into this bowl. And here we have it, dehydrated peas and dehydrated cheese. I'm gonna be honest with you guys. This is not the first time that I've seen Frank in the videos with Epicurious. And I have to say that I think it would be very fun to have Frank as a teacher in school. The way that he makes a paella may be a little different from what I'm used to, but Frank is a very good teacher and you're lucky to have him. I am presenting you my mise en place. Mise en place. Get your mise en place together. Mise en place. So mise en place is something that we use as a term in the kitchen. It's international, it's a French term, but it is international. I've used it in more than one country. So the mise en place can be your equipment, your mise en place. It can also be your setup, but it can also mean the mise en place, your ingredients to get your mise en place sorted. And if any of you are just starting in the kitchen, get used to hearing this term a lot because the chefs would typically say mise en place, especially in the international kitchens. Time to assemble our carbonara frittata. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> All right, let's get our custard in the bowl. I am going to add pasta. I don't think I'm gonna use it all. Bacon with all the fat. Don't wash this pan, put it aside just like this. Let's give this a stir. And then we're gonna put in a nice helping of cheese. I think I'll start with just two little nests of my fresh guitar, because it's gonna cook up really quick. So I'm gonna do it quickly, and I'm stirring right away as I burn my left hand. The good thing about cooking fresh pasta is that it cooks in minutes, like just two to three minutes. And the other good thing with fresh pasta is that you can freeze it, and from frozen, it will cook in just a few minutes. I'm gonna put the pasta right in. It only took a couple minutes, guys. It's okay if I use have a little bit of uh, water in here because I'm gonna add water, as a matter of fact. I saved my pan that has all that nice bacon fat in it and try and even everything out. I want the pasta to be evenly dispersed so that when I cut into it, there's not just a super eggy part with no pasta. My pan was nice and hot, it's bubbling away. I'm gonna get a nice crispy brown bottom. Let's get in the oven. Pasta in a tortilla, wow in a frittata. I don't know, to me it's bizarre. <laughs> I'm not used to seeing it. Let us throw our guanciale in and our rendered oil. Lovely, lovely. I'm just gonna hold it and let it drip. I'm using all of it. In case our sauce is a little too thick, we wanna take a little of that seasoned pasta water and put it in just to make our sauce creamy. Ooh, it's getting creamy. One, you can even use, say, a bain-marie and actually temper the eggs. So you start the cooking process you don't want to scramble them, but just to temper them a bit before adding the pasta in, and then it can be nice and velvety, the sauce. Or you can do it as Lorenzo has done here, where he just adds the hot pasta and the hot water to this, and then that starts the cooking process with the eggs. It is that time to play, guys. Oh my gosh. Ay caramba. Sorry. Sorry. Eeks. I'm going to do the old surgeon style cut. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Look at that. Look, oh my gosh, I'm so happy about this. The back is nice and crunchy. The pasta and the egg is holding everything together. The cream and everything got into the rigatoni. If this was a Spanish tortilla, I would say that that is too overcooked. I'm gonna say this is a winner before I even finish it. I'll clean it up in a minute. Pepper. I like adding pepper. And then, oh my gosh, why not? More cheese. We're gonna take that black pepper cream and we're gonna make a quenelle. Oh, Frank's gonna be making a quenelle. 
This is good. I was taught the two spoon method, shake them off, get your cream and just kind of go and make your football shape. Just a little dollop right there. Last but not least, let's make this ultra fancier and finish with some delicious, beautiful, extra virgin olive oil. Take some of our nice crunchy cheese and then some of our nice dried out peas. And there you have it, carbonara frittata. I bet Lorenzo did just fine. It's getting harder and harder to stump him lately. Lorenzo does do better in every single video that we've seen him cook. Like seriously, he seems to improve. And some of these videos have been like sporadic. So, you know, they've been a little later, a little before, but in every single video, Lorenzo seems to do really good. So this is my take on Chef Frank's pasta carbonara. From the beautiful ingredients that were used, I don't think I could mess this up. Yeah, I'm curious what he did with my ingredients though. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> not bad, not bad. Not bad, not bad. I think I've been watching too much Uncle Roger. I'm starting to imitate him. Wow, you are too <laughs> fancy, man. What did you do? Uh, frittata carbonara. I just want to try it. Is it okay I try it? Yeah, already? try it, try it. I'm not even going to use the knife. I'm just going to dig in because I'm a okay, savage. I just want to... <laughs> That's fantastic. It does taste like you're eating carbonara in a different form yep. of a bite. It has all the elements. Here's the flavor. Black pepper cream. Yeah. Steep some black pepper in heavy cream. Ooh. Like a tea. Let it cool, strain it out, whip it up. You're good, man. If anybody from Epicurious is watching, Frank, Lorenzo, either of you are watching this, I would love to go to New York and to cook with you guys. I really would. And hopefully this year, we can make that happen. And Brian Sow, if you're watching, I would like to cook with you as well. So, you know, we can actually make some, I don't know, paella or risotto, sandwiches, whatever. But we can have some fun. Wanna try mine? Let's try yours, All please. Right. Mm. 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 The pasta is cooked perfectly. It's beautiful. It has a very old European taste to yes. it. You hit it. I mean, yeah. you hit it, right? So the sauce is creamy without any cream, right? Yes. And that's the whole idea. It's the cheese, yeah. it's the fat, it's yeah. the water. I do recall giving you something else. Mm. Just like the Italians, you sit down, you eat, you have a glass of wine. Yes. So let's do it. Spend time with friends. Cheers to Cheers. you. Mm, that's a great way to end the video. <laughs> that really is. Have a nice glass of wine and, uh, well, enjoying what you made. Couldn't ask for anything else. Oh, that is a nice glass of wine. Overall, Lorenzo did a really good job, especially for not having like any guidance on how to make it. He did excellent. And Frank, uh, well, it's impressive that he made what he made out of the ingredients that he had. And I think Frank did good. And like I said, guys, I would love to cook with all of you. So hopefully this coming year, we can make all these things happen. And of course, Uncle Roger as well. That would also be fantastic. If you guys did enjoy this video, then be sure to give it a like, give it a share, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button because every little bit counts and it means a lot to me. And check out this next video coming up right here. Check out Jamie Oliver's Carbonara as well. And I will see you guys again very soon. Until then, take care.